Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. in Switzerland, and it's Space Café Web Talk time. Our Space Café Web Talk, 33 minutes with Dr. Peter Marcinez, will begin soon. Thanks for joining us today or about our talk or to our talk about growth and sustainability in space and ensuring the long-term usability of Earth orbits and beyond. As always, we appreciate your participation participation and ongoing feedbacks. And there will be a time that I will talk in proper English, but it's not today, obviously. However, I'm Thorsten Kreening. I'm your host today and publisher of spacewatch.global. We are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcasts. Our new episode, number 19, features Yuna McCormick, our Star Trek science fiction writer. And that's an episode outside our legal or tech space domate, a dom dominated sphere. Um, and it's absolutely super cool to listen. Best is with a glass of wine or tea or whatever. We also keep our fan shop online open for you where you can support us actively and become a space watcher. Edition one has cool mugs, awesome t-shirts, reflecting t-shirts and backpacks and much more cool items for you, your friends and the ones you love. Your support is needed to keep our work alive for you. If you have missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the event section and on YouTube. We host our Space Cafe web talks live on a weekly base, and this is already the 42nd edition today. As we all know, 42nd is the answer to all the questions in the universe, so the bar is high today. I'm totally honored today and excited to have one very inspiring space guest in my show, someone I admire for his outstanding work in the past and, of course, for his current activities. With that, a very warm welcome, Dr. Peter Martinez, to our Space Café. Peter is the Executive Director of the Secure World Foundation, and uh, we will he hear from him a bit, about the, a bit more about the Secure World Foundation in a second. He has an extensive experience in multilateral space diplomacy, space policy formulation and space regulation. He also has outstanding experience in capacity building and space science and technology in and in, in workforce, de workforce development. Prior to joining the Secure World Foundation, he chaired the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space Working Group on the Long-Term Sustainability of Outer Space Activities that has been adopted two years ago by consensus. And congratulations for this amazing work. From 2010 to 2015, he was the chairman of the South African Council of Space or for Space Affairs, the National Regulatory Authority for Space Activities in South Africa. And from 2014 to 2018, he was professor for, of space studies at the University of Cape Town where he also earned his PhD. He has authored or co-authored over 200 publications on topics in space policy, space sustainability, astronomy, space research, space law, and space policy. Once more, welcome, Peter, to my show. It's a pleasure to have you. Let's start. For our viewers, our listeners, um, and I know many of you are Knowing the Secure, the Secure World Foundation, as we had a few guests from there in our show already. But please, can you describe your organization and its activity for the newbies today? Sure. Well, firstly, Torsten, let me begin by thanking you for inviting me on your show. I'm absolutely honored and delighted to be here today. Um, greetings to all the viewers uh, watching this program and, and, of course, special greetings to my friends and colleagues who are viewing today. Uh, Secure World Foundation is a private uh, endowed operating foundation that's dedicated to the secure and sustainable use 
of space for the benefit of um, the earth and all of its peoples. We're based in the United States with offices in um, Broomfield, Colorado and Washington, D.C., but we have a very broad international footprint in terms of our partnerships and activities. We work with governments, industry, international organizations and civil society to develop and promote ideas for the secure, sustainable and peaceful uses of outer space. And we carry out our mission in three ways, namely informing, facilitating and promoting. By this, I mean that we generate research and analysis to raise awareness of key issues influencing the stability and sustainability of outer space uh, to support the creation of sound policy. We also facilitate dialogues that might otherwise not happen or support broader participation in dialogues. And we promote the implementation of viable measures or ideas that emerge from these dialogues. Since taking over the reins of Secure World Foundation in 2018, I've been building on the work of my predecessors, Michael Simpson and Ray Williamson, to keep us at the forefront of space sustainability discussions worldwide. This includes expanding our focus from our traditional um, Earth, uh, close to Earth orbit uh, domain to now the cislunar domain and issues like uh, space resources governance, and of course the growing uh, importance of the commercial sector for space sustainability. I'm very proud to be at the helm of an incredibly talented and dedicated team of space professionals who do all this work. And um, in December 2020, the value of our hard work was publicly acknowledged when Secure World Foundation was awarded the Space News Space Stewardship Award. This was a great way for our team to end what was a very challenging year. Congratulations for this award from our competition. Uh, so that brings me to this point that we should start with an award series as well, but I'm, I'm not sure, but I mean, you, you deserved it definitely for, for this great work. So, I mean, the, it seems that Secure World Foundation has a really a long-term vision for space. What are your personal thoughts on the future of humanity in space? Would you like to elaborate on that a bit more? Sure. Uh, yes, as, as you point out, the, the nature of our mission at Secure World requires us to have a long-term vision for space. And of course, like all other organizations, we have strategic plans and frameworks to guide our decision-making. But as the executive director, I also need to think long-term beyond the typical five-year timeframes of strategic plans. So yes, I do have some personal thoughts on the future of humanity in space, which I'm very happy to share with you and, and the viewers this morning. Um, but before doing so, let me stress that these are my personal reflections of not, you know, Secure World Foundation predictions for the future. So let me begin by reflecting that many of us in the space business, uh, we envisage humanity's future in space along the lines portrayed in very optimistic movies like Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey that depicts a future human destiny in space. We often see this frame, human destiny in space, used. And it describes a future where humans live and work in space and the private sector has helped to extend the sphere of human economic activity into space. The first point I want to make is that uh, we cannot take this kind of future for granted. Um, let's briefly consider some of the forces that are shaping the future of space right now. We have a growing number and diversity of space actors. We are moving from a, um, a bipolar to a multipolar world in space. There is a growing influence of the private sector in space, so states are no longer the dominant actors. We're seeing the emergence of new kinds of space activities. We're seeing a growing orbital congestion and of course a worrying proliferation of space debris. We're also seeing a worrying proliferation of counter space capabilities accompanied by rhetoric of the inevitability of military conflict in space, which is very concerning. All of these forces will combine in different ways that can lead us on what I refer to as a high road in space, like the vision of uh, 2001, or a low road, which is a future of discord and conflict. Um, and that's a set of futures that we really would like to avoid. 
Now, one can apply the methods of future studies to investigate the possible ways that the space arena may evolve over the next 30 years or so to 2050. And the first step would be to identify potential drivers and boundary conditions. Um, you can uh, think of several of these, but for, for the purposes of, of this discussion, I'd like to focus on three. One is humans in space. The second is commercial potential of space activities. And the third is space governance or the effectiveness of space governance. That's not to say that these are the only factors shaping the evolution of the space arena, but they provide a useful lens through which to explore the dynamics of change. In terms of um, uh, the, the changes uh, and, and defining boundary conditions for these high roads uh, and low road scenarios, uh, let, let's look at, for example, the humans in space um, component. There, a high road scenario could be a future where um, many thousands of people from many nations live and work in uh, LEO and cislunar space, mm -hmm. um, possibly on the moon and perhaps, who knows, on Mars. Um, this human presence in space drives commercial, civil and military development space in space. And there's a sort of sustained tourism and human presence that creates demand for logistics from space, uh, manufacturing, space resources, transportation, etc. The low road scenarios are one where there are marginally more humans in space than the current levels. And mostly in these low road scenarios, humans would still go to space, but really just for exploration and research. And um, human space flight would, uh, would be at marginally higher levels than now. And things like space tourism would remain limited to just a few wealthy people. If we look at the commercial dimension, um, the high road scenarios would be those where commercial space has um, greatly expanded with many new kinds of services and activities. Um, you have routine commercial on-orbit servicing, refueling, debris removal, space manufacturing, resource extraction, etc. Space commercial space transportation becomes highly reliable, reusable, and increasingly affordable. And you see the emergence of a space economy worth trillions of, do of dollars reaching perhaps several percent of the global economy. The low road scenarios for commercial space are those where um, commercial space is basically at similar levels to what it is today and profitable activities continue to be confined to LEO or GEO applications for things like communications, with observation and PNT, pretty much similar to what we have today. And commercial space transportation remains still fairly prohibitively expensive and the space economy is, is still a small fraction of the global economy. Turning then to the governance uh, dimension, um, the high road scenarios for space governance are those where multilateral fora develop effective ways of dealing with emerging issues in space, such, such as space debris, um, uh, um, uh, counter space uh, concerns, and so on. And they strive for common understandings and adhere to international norms of behavior. And through this, it's possible to resolve things like the debris problem and space becomes a rules-based domain where actors behave responsibly and avoid tension and conflict. The low road scenarios are the opposite of this where um, there are many more countries operating in space but no collective global vision for the future of space this leads to a fragmented uh, regulatory framework um, that results in tensions and rivalries and um, multilateral fora are uh, incapable of coping with this and so um, states tend to act on a on a sort of a national basis and in the absence of collective action the debris pr problem grows to the point where certain orbits are effectively rendered unusable and we see the potential of conflict. So those, those are some of the, the possible directions in which uh, these scenarios could evolve. Wow, I need a second to digest that. Um, I mean, for me, all the high road scenarios are looking very 
positive into the future, and that's obviously the nature uh, nature of that. Um, so, I mean, maybe you can talk about more in detail of a few of these or uh, scenarios are taking into account also where we are. I mean, uh, we have a pandemic are uh, not solved. We are, I think we are on a <laughs> on a way, or as I call this year, that's for me is a year of hope, uh, at least in my lifetime. Uh, but I mean, either we can can manage it, get the vaccines out, get people are, are immune against it, and then going back from where we come from. But is that really a desirable future? I mean, have we been on a, on the right track? So I think all of that, this reality check comes into your uh, to your scenarios and well, as well. So maybe you can a little bit more elaborate or uh, on details of your thoughts. And I know we will <laughs> explode this 33 minute format here to going too much into the details, but just some give us some foods for thoughts. Sure. Um, so I think uh, in terms of the sort of the timescales I'm talking about here, this is considerably longer than um, the recovery uh, from COVID. So I think COVID is a, uh, is a sort of a, a momentary setback, if you like, uh, in, in the evolution of the space arena. But um, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, we won't see uh, the recurrence of, of other new strains emerging in, in rapid succession that will uh, dramatically change the, the future of the world. Uh, so let's assume that for the purposes of this discussion that COVID is uh, on, on this time scale of sort of fairly isolated event from which we recover. Um, looking then further ahead to these possible scenarios, um, I, I like, I, I will group them in terms of four possible sets of scenarios just to make it it's, uh, easier to, to grasp. Um, so if we look at, uh, let, let's begin with what one might imagine the most positive, optimistic, inclusive and expansive scenario. Um, I call that the 2001 scenario um, uh, inspired by the movie, of course. And in this scenario, this is one where um, the world has managed to address um, the, um, the space governance uh, issue. Um, so cooperative space governance uh, has been realized in these future scenarios. And the commercial sector is also developed in a very successful way. So in this scenario, humanity manages to come together to address the major global challenges through cooperative governance. Uh, this is a, these are a set of futures where many humans live and work in space. Um, humans have um, uh, been to Mars. Uh, millions of people uh, ha have been to space in these future scenarios. And space services and resource use are common. And as I said, we have a, um, a trillion dollar uh, or multi-trillion uh, dollar space economy. Um, so. Uh, the, 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 this is one sort of, if you like, the most optimistic set of scenarios. Um, another set of scenarios is one where um, humanity manages to uh, address the corporate governance, uh, sorry, cooperative governance challenges, but um, our future, our destiny is not in space, unlike the first scenario. Uh, and this is not something that uh, that space people will often talk about, but it is it is possible to imagine future scenarios where humanity has managed to come together to address the major global challenges, but the commercial sector has, um, but 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 humanity focuses inwards on Earth rather than outwards in space, and. Um, most of the, the commercial space activities is really in support of uh, sustainable development on Earth. And there is some exploration of space, but that is still largely a government activity and humanity remains largely Earth-bound and Earth-focused. And in these scenarios, things like space tourism are still limited to fairly a few fairly wealthy people. Um, there would be a limited demand for on-orbit services, such as refueling and ADR, a limited use of space resources, um, and uh, exploration uh, would continue, but probably be mostly robotic or supported through AI. And these are scenarios where 
uh, in future the world becomes more inward looking than outward looking. A third set of scenarios um, is one uh, where humanity has failed to address the major global challenges through cooperative governance. Um, governance is fragmented and focuses on national priorities. Um, issues like space debris continue to be a major threat and space becomes a domain of military operations and uh, basically serves political and military ends. And because of this, um, commerce becomes, uh, commercial space becomes fairly stifled and, uh, and limited. Uh, in these scenarios, uh, I could imagine that space debris could be a, a huge hazard because there's fragmented governance, so therefore no uh, coordinated effort to address issues like legacy debris, and um, it's everyone for themselves in orbit. Um, and you, you can imagine multiple rivalrous poles of space power emerging, each with their own um, activities, but not much cooperation and, and, and a sort of a limited human presence in space, mainly in support of um, political and, um, and nationalistic goals. The final set of scenarios are those where, uh, and I, I call these the sort of the Elysium type scenarios, those are the ones where um, space is congested, rivalrous, and exclusive. So these are scenarios where governance has failed, but the, the pr uh, private space actors have stepped in to fill the void, as it were. So um, in these scenarios, humanity has failed to address major global challenges through cooperative governance, and corporations are now the, the major space actors and operate in space and on the moon, largely unencumbered by regulations. Uh, in these scenarios, many people uh, go into space and work in space, but space remains the preserve of wealthy uh, elites. And um, just um, to, to give you an example of this, um, uh, we, we have seen cases in the past where uh, large corporations have essentially almost had the power of states to, to explore, to create new settlements, to uh, establish armed forces, uh, even to wage uh, warfare. Um, and so there are examples of this in, in our history uh, on Earth. So um, these four sets of scenarios are ways that uh, the space, uh, uh, space arena could evolve. And um, I think it's up to us to think about which directions we would like the world to go um, so that we uh, head towards the scenarios that we would prefer to see and avoid those that we would not like to see. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I mean, it's it's still echoing on, 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 my, on my end and I'm not sure which kind of scenarios I prefer here and which I see as realistic, but are, I mean, you, you I think you pointed them in this brief or envelopes out very well. Or so how will we know which of these scenarios are playing out and what can, yeah, as you said, what can we do to shape the future to be the future we want rather than the future we don't, we don't want? I mean, you have been on the on the UN side. We have seen what happened this year with the UN, or uh, and or um, well, not this year. Sorry, last year uh, with the, with the pandemic. So, which one we are heading to? Well, I think that uh, what, what we should do, uh, we, we can we can look for signals that certain of these scenarios are emerging. So you can think of signals as things that you might read as newspaper headlines. Mm -hmm. And so um, as uh, each of these scenarios, we don't have the time to go into this, but with each of these scenarios, you could sit down and imagine the kinds of newspaper headlines that you might read. And from those, you could then start to look out for the, the signals of particular sets of um, scenarios emerging. And, um, and in fact, this is really the way that um, 
uh, many people who do uh, use these uh, methods of future studies do that. They um, develop scenarios mm. and then look for these signals of emerging scenarios. Um, the other thing that you can do, of course, is to um, start with um, a, a kind of set of scenarios that you would like to see, see where you are today, and then figure out the changes that you would need to introduce at national and at intergovernmental level to work towards those particular sets of preferred scenarios. But this requires a shared common vision for the future in space. And this is why um, international bodies like uh, UN COPUS are so important because this is the one forum where states can get together and discuss a shared vision for, for a future in space. Now, I would like to take you up or on on, and, or invite you for uh, an in-depth discussion about the scenarios and have a, a bigger round, not to, not just the two of us, but or I've, I've just seen that that our editor in chief Marcus is uh, on the um, on the listener side here as well. So a, a wave to him to to think about a potential summit, uh, inviting Peter and, and and a few others are to discuss that in a in a. In a, in a broader way, I mean, sure, we, we, we can't and we will not uh, um, replace the UN or any other um, governmental or intergovernmental body. We just can foster the dialogue here in the civil society. But, I mean, it's, it's super interesting and I would really dig into it much further, but due to our own format. So I would like to swing back now to the yeah, to the near term future or the near future. Um, I mean, last year, the Secure World Foundation prepared a briefing for at that point of time, the incoming Biden administration. And thanks God, everything was peaceful. So we, you have now a new president in the States and the world is cheering you for it. But now the work starts. So what are some of the um, salient our recommendations to the new administration you you laid out yeah th thanks for for raising this uh, and of course very timely well as we all know presidential trans transitions are always accompanied by change but the one point that i'd like to make is that the fundamentals of u.s space policy have actually been quite consistent across multiple administrations and um, indeed many of the trump administration space policy decisions built on work that was started under the Obama administration and really continue long-standing principles that have mm -hmm. persisted across multiple administrations, both Republican and Democrat, largely because they reflect core American beliefs and interests. Having said that, the change in administration is an opportunity for the U.S. to take stock of what is happening in space policy and to provide some mid-course adjustments, if you will. Uh, hence, our development of the document that you referred to containing policy recommendations for the incoming Biden-Harris administration. Um, under the, the leadership of the National Space Council, which was reestablished by the Trump administration, we believe solid progress was made on updating the, the U.S. space policy um, to accommodate uh, several, you know, the, the rapidly changing space um, environment. And uh, while some of the Trump administration's policy decisions um, and initiatives uh, were met with criticism, we believe that that was more due to the political rhetoric that accompanied those decisions and initiatives rather than their substance per se. And in our document, we urge the Biden-Harris administration to build on these recent national space policy decisions that reflect really longstanding US principles, but while uh, at the same time abandoning the divisive and antagonistic rhetoric that accompanied some of those policy changes. Um, first and foremost among these is I think the, the important role of the US continuing to provide international leadership in ensuring the long-term sustainability, safety and security of the space domain. Um, this isn't an issue of altruism, but really to ensure that the states can continue to use space for, um, for its, its own national benefits in the future. And of course, it benefits all other nations as well. 
Um, we also advocate for consistency across um, key uh, national space efforts, uh, which will help to um, move the, the US forward and demonstrate stability to our international partners and avoid uh, a constant resetting and lack of strategic direction that uh, has sometimes plagued um, previous presidential transitions. So I don't have time to go into the details of this. The document is available on our website and I invite the viewers to, um, to download the document and to have a look at its contents. I would, um, before we have to end, or uh, I would like to or go on or a few questions that we got from 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 the audience and uh, one remark uh, to to Kevin or uh, and and his or uh, text or uh, in in the chat. Uh, you will be pleased to see that uh, Jessica West will be one of our upcoming guests. So, point taken. Uh, Irene, um, I'm happy to that you made it and are uh, great to see you here in this chat. Um, Irene asks, when I think uh, some longer about space, I think about my feelings having no space at all out there. Our bodies are not made for the circumstances at all. The worst place on Earth suits our bodies better than somewhere else in space. Isn't the idea of going into space too much based on escape escapism? Um, what would I want to live in such an uncomfortable and unfree situation? I mean, it goes more the philosophic track, but so what is your point on that? So Irene, that's an excellent question. And that's why I included in my set of scenarios, the second one where we have resolved the governance issues. The world knows from a governance perspective how to do space, but we decide collectively as humanity that our future isn't on, is in space. It isn't living on the moon or Mars or uh, in uh, one of the Lagrange points. It's actually right here on Earth and that we should use our space capabilities to improve our life on Earth. Um, and we, it'll be interesting to see with the incoming Biden administration, you know, what kind of emphasis will be placed on um, global climate change and the environment. So um, I, uh, I think we, you know, in the space community, we're so focused on uh, a, a humanity's destiny in space and thinking that that is the, the future, but the rest of humankind may not be as obsessed with going into space as, as us space geeks are. And I think we need to, to bear this in mind because that, that is a possible set of futures for humanity and there is still a role for the space community, mm -hmm. but a different sort of role. So thank you for asking that question. I think it's important for us to remember that. Yeah, I think I promised you an audience that has really listened to what we are saying and, and are resonating to that. Cheryl, uh, we will put the, uh, um, the address for Peter's or for the Secure World Foundation paper in the, uh, in the email um, with, a, with a recap. So that's, that point is taken. I would like to take the question from Christian um, because it goes into the other domain what, what Secure World Foundation is working on very intense. While we are oops, it's jumping, where is it? Here is it. While we are discussing inter international governance and transnational well-being in space, what would be your view on how criminal or terrorist organizations of the future could copy the commercial space initiatives and expand to space as well? I think it's an absolute valid point. Well, I, I think it's, uh, you know, where, where humans go, uh, all of our weaknesses uh, will follow. And, uh, and I, I think that as, as humanity exp expands into space, um, it is not out of the question that uh, we may see the emergence of, of some forms of criminal activities that make use of space systems. I mean, that's pretty much happening right now, of course, it's, you know, I mean, so um, I, I, do, I do consider that to be a possibility. Um, in terms of the future scenarios I was talking about, more likely to occur in the set of scenarios that I referred to as Elysium, where you have corporate actors that dominate the space environment. And in the lack of regulation and government oversight, you could imagine all sorts of corrupt and criminal practices taking place. We see it here in the terrestrial context, um, for example, in many, in many areas of natural resource extraction. So why could it not happen in space as well? 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the last question I would like to uh, take uh, is from, from Chero. Um, what about the many private uh, space settlement initiatives, whether corporate or private space communities? Do you see any possibilities for some other possible unforeseen positive, less dystopic scenarios? Um, yes, I guess so. I mean, uh, so, uh, you, you know, the, 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 uh, the set of scenarios that I refer to as 2001, it's not one specific scenario, it's just a, 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 a sort of generic uh, name for a collection of, of if you like, um, inclusive, expansive, optimistic scenarios. This could be one. And this is the fun thing about these uh, future uh, studies exercises is um, once you begin the conversation, all sorts of other possibilities come up and one has to then, you know, go into the details. And so, um, uh, and, and perhaps just make one remark, um, a year or two ago, having this kind of uh, scenario based thinking for space might have been a bit harder uh, you know, pre-pandemic, but I think, you know, the the pandemic, uh, the recent political events in the U.S. have shown how the established order can be upset uh, really quite quite quickly and easily. And so I think it's it has made it easier for people to to think um, uh, more expansively than than they might otherwise. So yeah, it's an interesting set of possible scenarios to consider. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you, Cinder, to uh, send the, the link. I will copy it in the our, in the thank you email or that goes out uh, in two hours, or I think to to the audience, so that it is then well covered. I'm afraid we have to come to an end as we stick to our 33 minute format, and we are on 33 minute plus. But I mean that's a liberty we we have, um, and please, all of you, are stay with us a few more minutes or longer. Um, Please, or, um, Peter, be assured that we will continue the following the topics in, that you raised are in our future cafes, in our magazine, and you know that we are um, following your work, the work of the Secure World Foundation as close as possible. For those that like to talk more about the topic, we will start a clubhouse launch in a few minutes. Just search for Space Cafe at 4:45 uh, CET or uh, today, and let's experiment with this um, with this new platform. Uh, I know it's limited access and it's better, but let's give it a chance. And another time, apologize for our full set of next events. And you see, that's just the next three weeks that we are covering here. On Thursday, our morning, our and it's I know it's it's. It's not well suited for the American continent. So at 9.30 a.m. CET, um, we start another very uh, uh, Australian friendly event or Asia friendly event or Space Cafe, Space Law Breakfast with Stephen Freeland, um, including uh, Donna, Laura and um, Chris Newman for the first edition where we talk about some current events and their application um, and how space law fits in. Um, very interesting conversation. We we think, our, yeah, let's give it a chance and I uh, hope to see you there. And based on the response we got so far uh, from our audience, uh, it's it's nicely taken. On the 2nd of February, I will host our Dr. Marco Ferrazani, the head of legal of ESA as my guest. And a week later, um, very proud to have the new executive director of Intersputnik, Elena Morozovar, as my guest. And Elena, welcome also here in the audience again. And based on the views in the news item when our Elena was our promoted as an executive director um, that we put on LinkedIn, over I think about ten thousand views we had on this uh, on this uh, news item. I think we have to increase also our virtual room. Uh, so. Get, or it'll be fast to get your seats there. Um, that week, we will hold two more exciting events. On the 10th of February, we'll launch our Space Cafe Brazil by Ian Grossner. Ian, welcome also here in the audience. Uh, and that will be in Portuguese. His first guest will be Olavo Bittencourt. Um, I think one 
other excellent uh, speaker and, and mind on the on the space law space policy side. Um, and one day later, on the 11th of February, Moriba will host the next Moriba Vox Populi and talking about with his guest about space and religion. And he, I think, has um, representatives from all the major religions worldwide are in his in his panel, and that would be an amazing thing to see. Or and I mean. He is brave enough to, to touch this very delicate, very sensitive topic. And just this morning, we put on, uh, online, and I referred uh, to it earlier, on the 16th of February, February, my guest will be Dr. Jessica West from the uh, Project Plug Shares in Canada to talk about norms of behaviors as well. All the events are online on Eventbrite. As always, we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, on Facebook, or LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up to our daily and our, or our bi-weekly newsletters. And if you like to treat yourself with something special, become a Space Watcher. Your support is needed and will help us. Take your credit card and visit our fan shop at shop.spacewatch.global. I know that I repeat myself, but we need your support to continue our work. That's as easy as it is. Thank you all very much for your interest. And thank you, Peter, for your inspiring and excellent talk. And yeah, also being our guest. And I hope that's not the last time. And thanks again to the entire team behind the scenes for doing their great job week by week again. And I hope you all will stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks for joining us. I hope to see you next time. In the meantime, visit us on our website or on social media. Don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.